Well, folks, this is the last of the uh, videos of the uh, series titled Against That Mixture, the Neanderthal series. And um, I wanted to tie some loose ends, some things that may not have become clear from my informal chats with my son. Especially, I want to get, get you to think of the main points that I wanted to get across. And um, one of those is that you know, we, we were two different species, the Neanderthals and humans. The Neanderthals uh, had a different type of mitochondrial DNA. We, have, we find no mitochondrial, no Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA in humans today. That means we had no mothers because mitochondrial DNA is passed on from mother to child. And if we have none, well, that means that, uh, you know, we had no Neanderthal mothers. We have no um, Neanderthal chromosome, uh, Y chromosomes. That means um, we had no Neanderthal fathers either. Uh, y chromosomes are passed on from father to son. We have none, then that means we have no evidence of these, no objective evidence that we had any Neanderthal fathers. And in fact, we have no objective data showing that Neanderthals and humans ever met. So far we have not been able to place humans and Neanderthals at the same place at the same time. So there's no objective evidence for any of those. The only uh, tiny amount of evidence that you could say, and again it's stacked up against uh, admixture, is that we have about 2%. Any human has about 2% uh, Neanderthal DNA in him. And the question is whether that 2% comes from interbreeding or from the fact that we have a common ancestor. One happened allegedly 50,000 years ago or so, and the other one happened 500,000 years or so ago. So it's a, it's, it, that's the question. The question is whether our 2% comes from interbreeding or from our common ancestor. And you know, uh, you've got a, there's a, um, uh, there, there's a lot of playing around with the numbers, with the data. And uh, we find that, you know, some people say it's, we have 2%. There's a study, and I think that's in video, what, number four, um, talks about the fact that we have maybe up to 7%. And then they find this Oost Ishin man in the middle of Siberia, and he's, he's dated to about 45,000 years ago, and he also had 2.3%, just like any human today, which again uh, stacks up against admixture. And um, essentially, we were two different species. We were two different species uh, by the definition of the word species, and I covered that subject in uh, what, video number seven. We were two different species because if we define the word species as successful interbreeding, as having fertile offspring, and the human race is said to have started 200,000 years ago, the human species, right? It means that today, no human today, would be able to interbreed with one of our, our ancestors 200,000 years ago. In other words, 200,000 years ago we have to put out as the cutoff date for the species of humans. Anyone beyond that, anyone be before that, we could not interbreed with today successfully. That's what it means. That's what the word species would mean. And what it really means is that there's been um, so many mutations. Since that time, uh, there's been this genetic drift. And so none of us today would be able to interbreed with one of our oldest ancestors, maybe 200, you can even take it 250, 300,000 years ago. But what does that mean? If that's true, <laughs> it means we could not have interbred with someone 500 that separated from our lineage 500,000 years ago, and that's the case of the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals by, uh, uh, forked out from our, or branched out from our lineage say anywhere be between 400 and 600,000 years ago. These numbers are very the ranges are very wide. But assuming if we just take a, a number, 500,000 years ago, we could not today interbreed with anyone 500,000 years ago from our own lineage, let alone from a parallel lineage like the Neanderthals, which branched off and went into Europe into a different environment. 
So if the word species means interbreeding, successful interbreeding, having fertile offspring, we could not have it with anyone in our own lineage 200,000 years ago. Anyone beyond my mitochondrial leave 200,000 years ago is beyond our reach. We cannot have sex, uh, successful children with, with someone. If we could go to the past or they could come into the future, we could not have successful uh, children. Uh, fertile children. Um, there are also different species because the Neanderthals didn't wear clothes. And we did. We were born apparently in Africa and we migrated to Europe. That's the theory and that's the theory widely accepted and I think it's a pretty good theory because we find no human bones in Europe until about 35,000 years ago. And um, if that's the case that means we went there found it to be cold for us, and we had to put cold clothes on. And that's probably when we invented clothes. We had no need for clothes until then. And the Neanderthals, you know, they, they branched out from us way back when, in the days of uh, Homo erectus. Homo erectus goes to Western Europe, goes to France, goes to Spain, goes to England. There, there was a passage there where the channel is today. In those days, you could walk across. And they went all the way to England. We find uh, 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 human uh, remains and artifacts, uh, tools, etc. in uh, Happisburg and Pakesfield, England. And from that line, from those Homo erectus in England, that's where the Nand first the... Uh, Homo heidelbergensis comes in. He's got about, what is it, about 1,100 uh, cc's, 1,200 cc's, uh, cubic centimeter in cranial capacity, and eventually ends up evolving into Neanderthals. And that happened uh, maybe anywhere between 400 and 600,000 years ago. 500,000 is a good ballpark figure. So, so, so these fellows, you know, the first Homo erectus who got to England he had no clothes. <laughs> he couldn't have survived in that environment. Uh, you know, uh, he, he survived in that environment, I mean, uh, without clothes. He, he didn't invent clothes. I'm, I'm sure that nobody's going to argue that Homo erectus invented clothes. And so how did he live in England? And so uh, if Neanderthal descends from that Homo erectus who goes through Homo uh, Heidelbergensis and ends up with Homo uh, Neanderthalensis. Uh, all these, none of them had clothes, but we did have clothes. So we would have not only noticed that their heads were a little different because, you know, they had these big heads, big noses, but they were nude. And I visualized them as very hairy gorillas. Uh, I think they had hair. I, I don't think uh, the line that led to Neanderthal lost their hair. And so I think they would have recognized each other as a separate species and that's very unlikely, highly unlikely, that these two different animals would have interbred in the wild. Um, and then there's the other issue of rape. Was this a one-night stand, a few Neanderthals who had sex with them, assuming, assuming that we had sex with them, right? Uh, they, they, almost all the uh, uh, papers talk about limited interbreeding, that there was limited contact. Well, what does that mean? Is that rape? One night stand? You know, you have sex one night and, and you had an offspring? Is that going to cause the extinction of the Neanderthals? And I want to make sure that you understand that admixture is a is an extinction theory. He who doesn't understand that has not understood the first thing about admixture. Admixture is not a, a theory that says, oh, we had sex with the Neanderthals, and that's why we have 2% uh, DNA of their DNA in our body. No, that's got nothing to do with that. The admixture theory is an extinction theory. Let that be absolutely clear. It is, it is pushed by people like Eric Trinkhaus. It's... Uh, uh, pushed by people like uh, Milford Wolpoff and John Hawks and other famous names of, pa of Neanderthal paleontology. All these people believe that Neanderthals disappeared because they interbred with us. 
So it is an extinction theory, okay? And of course, it gave jobs to all the geneticists, and so they're absolutely happy with it. But then if it was a one-night stand, it was rape in the bushes in the middle of the jungle there, um, would this cause the extinction of the entire population of Neanderthals? And I think the answer is no, because, you know, what happened to the other Neanderthals? Why did they continue reproducing Neanderthals, purebred Neanderthals? They would still be around. So admixture did not cause the extinction of the Neanderthals, and that's what admixture is claiming that it did, okay? So I want to make those points. I want to make sure that you leave with those points in your mind. But this uh, video is specifically about, it's titled, Political Science. And the reason I titled it that way is because I want, I want to focus on the politics that was behind admixture, how they pushed this interbreeding theory, not only to the top of the charts, but spread it around the world and made everyone believe in it. And I want to focus this specific, specifically on two points. One is uh, the language that they used. You look at the language in the papers, and it's very cautious. You know, they use words like may and perhaps. They suggest, insinuate. But when they talk to the public, it's a done deal. The language is sweeping. And I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of information. I'm going to read a couple of... Uh, uh, things from the literature so that you can compare and contrast how they talk to the public versus how they talk to their peers. And then the other one I uh, uh, want you to uh, be aware of is that, you know, a geneticist is a liar. And that's the best thing I can say about him. He's a liar. Why, where does he lie? Well, he lies uh, in first in claiming or giving you the impression, misleading you to believe that genetics is an exact science. It is not. What they're doing is packaging opinion as truth, as fact, as a done deal. That's what they're doing. That's what the geneticists are doing. Then they hide, they lie when they hide data that uh, debunks their theories. Then they give you the impression that, well, you know, um, we were skeptical of interbreeding, but the data just overwhelmed us and we had to accept it. Uh, and then they play around with the numbers. Uh, you'll see how they play around with the percentages. Again, it's got to do with, with their opinions and not with objective data or with genetics being in a, a, uh, an exact science. They play around with the percentages. And the fact that all these geneticists come up with different numbers and different ranges. In fact, they have quite wide ranges in many aspects. This will give you an idea, this should give you an idea that, you know, these people play around with the numbers. But then, since people believe that genetics is an exact science, that they can tell you what diseases we inherited from the Neanderthals or whatever, then they, you know, these people are like gods. Whatever comes out of their mouth is truth. And so this is where the danger is. So let's go with the first one. I want to show uh, here. This is um, from the original genome paper in 2010. And I want you to look, focus on the cautious language that the team that prepared the paper, the people who worked on the genome project, uh, how they uh, talk. They talk very cautiously. And I want you to compare that against some statements from the literature where the statements are totally, you know, we have sweeping statements. Here's the first one. This comes again from Green 2010, that's the original genome paper. It says, the data suggest that between 1 and 4% of the genomes of people in Eurasia are derived from Neanderthals. The gene flow between Neanderthals and modern humans most likely occurred before the divergence. This may be explained by mixing of early modern humans with Neanderthals in the Middle East before their expansion into Eurasia. The analysis of the Neanderthal genome shows that they are likely to have had a role in the genetic ancestry of present-day humans. Okay, very clear. You look, you look at the words, suggest 
most likely, maybe, likely, you know, they, they have all this uh, vague language. Now compare this against how these people talk to the public. Here's one, uh, Moskowitz uh, in Life Science, May 6, 2010. The Neanderthals are not totally extinct, said study leader Svante Pabo of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. In some of us, they live on a little bit. Here's another one from uh, Pablo in one of his TED Talks, 2011. Today, people living outside Africa have about 2.5% of their DNA from Neanderthals. No ifs, ands, or buts. You know, it's straightforward. Here's another one, uh, uh, 2014. Our analysis shows that modern humans had already interbred with Neanderthals then, and we can determine when that first happened much more precisely than we could before, said Pablo. And a final one here. The Neanderthal genetic contribution to present-day people seems to have larger physiological effects than I would have naively thought, said Pablo. Okay, so, so you can see uh, the, uh, the contrast between the languages, how they talk to the peers very cautiously because they know a lot of peers are going to question them. But the public, you know, they just give sweeping statements. Yeah, we've proven it. It's a, it's a done deal. you got to accept it, make sure, Biko. We know. And that's, that's the danger. So that's politics. That's got little to do with science. But that's how they sold uh, admixture to the public. The next thing I want to show is the... Um, how they play with the numbers. And again, I want you to look at, uh, you know, among other things, uh, how they hide some of this data. For example, you know, I showed, I think, what was it in, um, uh, I think it was in, um, yeah, in video four through six, one of those, before specifically. And in that video, um, I show that uh, the, the, the starting hypothesis that the people from the Genome Project had was that humans uh, um, in, in Europe, Europeans, have more Neanderthal DNA than Africans. That was their starting hypothesis and it turned out to be apparently true. Or uh, That's what the objective data showed. But what they hid from the public is that Asians, specifically Papuan New Guineans or Papuans, and American Indians have more Neanderthal DNA than Europeans. And so we got a problem because, you know, we can't hide that data and just highlight the fact that Europeans have more than Africans. We also have to explain if the data shows that Asians and American Indians have more Neanderthal DNA than Europeans. We got to explain that fact as well. So the way they hide it from the public is by pitting non-Africans. They bunch all of us in, under non-Africans, and they pit us against Africans. So they always talk. They you'll don't never hear ever again them talking about you know Asians or American Indians. They'll just say, look. Non-Africans have more DNA than Africans, and that proves our theory. Yeah, but what about the Asians? They have more Neanderthal DNA than Europeans. You haven't explained that fact, and they never will. And then they play around, like I said uh, a minute ago, they play around with the numbers. Uh, here's a statement also from the original Genome Project. It says, the actual amount of interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans may have been very limited. Again, I mean, one night stand, uh, you know, that's how they became extinct. Given that it contributed only 1 to 4% of the genome of present day non Africans. Here's another one by Prover. It says, using the high coverage Neanderthal genome in conjunction with the two other Neanderthal genomes, we now estimate that the proportion of Neanderthal derived DNA in people outside Africa, again, non Africans, they never talk about, they never specify. <laughs> is 1.5 to 2.1 percent. So they went from 1 to 4 percent to 1.5 to 2.1 percent. But then uh, you have a study by Lasse, 2014, and he comes up with a totally different number uh, for being an objective science. Genetics really has quite a variety of values and ranges, and here you see it. 
Our analysis reveals that strong support for Neanderthal admixture in Eurasia at a higher rate, 3.4 to 7.3 percent, than suggested previously. And uh, so again, um, it shows that these people are playing with the numbers. But it turns out that there was uh, this Ustishim man that they did the genome on. He's a human, uh, allegedly 45,000-year-old human, and it says we present the high-quality genome sequence of a 45,000-year-old modern human uh, male from Siberia. We estimate that... Uh, the proportion of Neanderthal mixture in the Ust Ishim individual, individual to be 2.3 plus or minus 3 percent, similar to present day East Asians and present day Europeans. So, what should we conclude? I mean, if uh, the Ust Ishim man was a human and he was um, living 45,000 years ago, we concede this, right? And he had only 2 percent, 2.3 percent, which is what most people have today. And if we take now Lossi's number, which he says it's up to 7.3%, well, how did we gain Neanderthal DNA from 40,000 years ago to today? How did we, end, how did we start out with uh, 2.3 as the Usti Shim man had and ended up with 7.3 that Lossi says some people have today? How did they gain Neanderthal DNA? Are there still Neanderthals around, uh, living, walking around the streets? So you can see that genetic, that you, you have two points here. The first one is genetics is not an exact science because obviously they have all these numbers and ranges and they seem more like opinions than objective facts. And then the second one is that, you know, they have no way of explaining, assuming these numbers are correct, we concede them, that how is it that we gained Neanderthal DNA? And, of course, they, they have to, the ball is in their court. They have to explain this. Then we have another issue, and that's uh, this, uh, this trick that, uh, especially Svante Pavel, he was the head of the uh, Genome Project, and how, how they play around with this. They say, look, uh, I was skeptical of interbreeding. I didn't believe in it. But, you know, the, the data was overwhelming, and I finally had to accept it. This is the way they present it to the public. And here let me show you some of the, uh, the uh, statements made uh, throughout this time. In 2013, in Decoding the Neanderthals, a NOBA documentary, Svante Pablo says the following. He says, I was biased against interbreeding. There was no evidence for it, so I don't think it really happened. Now, he said this in 2013, so he really, he was talking in retrospect, so he, he really meant, I didn't think it really happened. Now, that's very hard to believe, and let me tell you why. In 1997, Svante Pavel was named head of the project, and since then, 1997 onwards, he was trying to prove mitochondrial DNA at all costs and against all odds. And he wasn't the only group. There were other groups doing the same thing. Well, I've got at least nine studies in my hand. And I think that's in uh, video number six. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That's uh, video number three. And uh, in those studies, it's very clear that we have no mitochondrial DNA, no Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. And the question is, you would say, well, you'd have to two or three tries, they would say, give it up and say, well, you know, there's, we, have, we have no Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. Why did they continue running tests? Well, because obviously they were not skeptical. They, they were trying to prove interbreeding at all costs. That's why. And uh, by 2000, what is it, 2007, 10 years later, Time Magazine, Names, Pablo is one of the hundred most influential individuals on earth. They did that because he, he was starting the, the uh, genome project for Neanderthal. And of course, after finding no, no mitochondrial DNA, they said, well, let's try nuclear DNA. And of course, it's very highly, highly, highly unlikely that they would have found no nuclear DNA, especially if we had a common ancestor. And in fact, they had to find a tiny residue, which is what we have today. 
Well, the only issue here was how we, how they, how a person like Swan de Pablo was going to interpret that data. Was he going to interpret it saying, um, yeah, that 2% comes from our common ancestor 500,000 years ago? Or was he going to say it comes from interbreeding 50,000 years ago? And there's a big difference. Because if we shared a common ancestor, of course we're going to have maybe 2% commonality. And that's different th than saying that, oh, look, humans went into Europe, we had sex, and that's how the Neanderthals disappeared, and that's why we have 2% today. That, those are two different theories of how we got our 2% Neanderthal DNA. And of course, uh, Time Magazine mentioned him or named him as uh, one of the most influential people because they already realized that he had a lot of power in his hand, uh, potential power. They knew that when he finished the project, he was going to come out with some amount of nuclear, uh, Neanderthal nuclear DNA in humans. And so they said, this guy, in three years, we're going to put him, you know, he's going to be our centerfold. So they were grooming him for that, for that future moment when he put out his report. And when he put out his report, he leaned on the side of admixture, without any reason, because if there's no mitochondrial DNA, there's also no Y chromosomes. And with all Y chromosomes, that means no human, no, no human male today has any Y chromosome from Neanderthal. Um, and we only have 2% DNA, which could just as well and probably did come from our common ancestor. Well, then we had nothing to do with the Neanderthals. But where would that have left? <laughs> where would that have left all the geneticists? They would have been without a job. Because if... Um, if we never had sex, we never met the Neanderthals after, you know, after we separated from our lineage 500,000 years ago. All geneticists since 2010 working on Neanderthal DNA would be out of a job. They're working on nonsense, on stuff that has nothing to do with anything. And that's, that's the issue. And, um, and so here, here you see how these, these people play around with the numbers, how they manipulate the public just to get their theory across. And, and, the, and the bottom line on, on all this is they have no alternative theory for the extinction of the Neanderthals if admixture dies. They have to go back to competition, again, involving humans, or that we killed them, or that we passed on diseases, or who knows what, or climate change, which is another one that's so famous out there. But I want to end this with, uh, with a sweeping remark. <laughs> that uh, one of the uh, members of Pablo's team said uh, in uh, a NOVA documentary titled Decoding Neanderthals. And that's Richard Ed Green. He says, we were able to convince the world that we have a little bit of Neanderthal in our genes. <laughs> so now you know what all that was about. It was about persuading Convincing, converting, recruiting, that's what it was about. It's got to do with, not science, it's got to do with political science. Uga. So, what do you think of the geeks that work at the Max Planck Institute? Well, let me tell you what I think. <laughs>